everything that does not represent the image of God begins to fall away. I saw a picture of, of angels galloping to the rhythm of our worship. For more of a prophetic instruction, you are confident. This year, the Lord has assured us until end that we are nothing missing, nothing broken, and that we are until we are coming out. We are believers, and indeed, we are sons called in a time and season such as this. In all that Sarah had said unto thee, hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And also of the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation, because he is thy seed. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and took bread and a bottle of water, and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder, and the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And the water was spent in the bottle, and she cast the child under one of the shrubs. And she went and sat down over against him, a good way off, as it were a bow shot. For she said, Let me not see the death of the child. And she sat over against him, and lift up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad. And the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven, and said unto her, what aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God had heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him in thine hand, for I will make him a great nation. And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the bottle with water, and gave the lad drink. And God was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness, and became an archer. And he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. And it came to pass at that time that Abimelech and... Okay. So once again, um, for friends online, apologies, the pictures took a bit of time to, for you to see the, the picture and the audio alongside. Um, and thank you to media for fixing that glitch quickly. The other scripture I'd like us to look at is Galatians chapter 4. It's a parallel to the scripture we just read. Galatians 4, um, that will be from 21, is it? Yes, 21. 21. Yeah. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the born woman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate had many more children than she which had an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh, flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit even so it is now nevertheless what saith the scripture cast out the bond woman and her son for the son of the bond woman shall not be here with the son of the free woman so then brethren we are not the children of the bond woman but of the free thank you so these two scriptures actually Apostle Paul was explaining what has, has transpired in Genesis chapter 21. Now, Genesis chapter, we, we, when we started this study, uh, Pastor Kingsley, earlier, our tagline for Abraham was covenants, blueprints, and patterns. You know, just showing the, the progression of the build up of Abraham's life. In Abraham, we see a blueprint, we see covenant trends being established we see divinity dealing with humanity and setting off 
setting us off on a course that God has predetermined even for the end of the age as a way of redeeming mankind. He just put Abraham there as a type, type and shadow, right? So here we find Abraham making a mistake in getting in that he got his maid pregnant and Hagar had a son, Ishmael. Now Ishmael is a lot older than Isaac. Isaac, the son of promise, was eventually born. Just tagging on from last week, by the way, was an awesome experience. Yes? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Just tagging on from where last week. You are generally last week rep here, right? <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> Interesting. Well, we have reached in the audience a whole lot of the contingents from last week, and you probably get to meet them soon during comments. So we just bumped out of the experience of the promise of God being fulfilled. And then we go into this very interesting Hollywood play. Uh, play. The boys are having a boys fight. So imagine an Ishmael that is 11 years. Having a normal, you know how some older kids can be mean. Or well, just be mean to Isaac. And then, then Sarah saw it. And then Sarah said to Abraham, No, this guy and his mom, they have to go like they have to go right now and for everyone abraham was beginning to find a semblance of normalcy he has been trusting god he has journeyed he has gone to egypt gone to abimelech he's just been ups and downs and and god kept saying i will i will and then finally he's promised so let's just be one big happy family and then another disruption and then abraham begins to the Bible said he was grieved. He was, he was upset. He was saddened. He being a gentleman, when this played out before, you remember, you recall that he asked Sarah when Hagar was pregnant, said, Hagar is despising you. She's your maid. Whatever you like, do with her. And that first time, Sarah sent her away and an angel sent Hagar back to Sarah. Now, this time, she's asking again and the man is so conflicted. So what we'll be doing today, man of God, will be estrain the conflict that the promise of God brings into your life as a believer. And, and how sometimes your, your joy of an answered prayer can be short-lived. And it introduces many times a decision for you. Every open door, somebody said new, new levels, new devils. new devils, you know. So every open door comes with its own challenges as it were. But Abraham showed us a pattern of dealing with hard times. He goes to God. And even me was shocked at God's response. I thought God would be empathic, empathetic to Hagar. But we'll, we'll be discussing as a panel today what could be a play there. Why did God side with Sarah? And then they, these people were thrusted out. And Abraham let them go with a sandwich and a bottle of water. In my mind, we're saying, Abraham, now, we know you. You marshaled the whole army from your house, defeated three kings, rescued Lot, had so much possession that when the king of Sodom dashed you, you say, I don't want your dash. I don't want your dash. I don't want you to say you made me rich. So how can you send this child out with sandwich and water into the wilderness? From Canaan to Egypt, let's say, not let's say, Hagar was making her way back home. That was a death sentence. It was clear. Now, but God said something to Abraham, and then he said to Abraham, I will also make Ishmael great. I will make him great. I will I will multiply him. So the panelists are here to discuss what would have prompted Abraham's decision. To let her go with such lean resources. And we know the we'll look at also the encounter of Hagar with the angel that prevented the death of Ishmael and Hagar. And eventually how God established um, Ishmael. But the truth is, that really is not our trust tonight. All of this storytelling then leads us to the analysis of Paul to the church in Galatians. And I'll speak on that for two minutes 
and then I yield the floor. Paul started Galatians chapter 4 saying, a hair is not different from a servant as long as he's a child. And he started speaking to the Galatian church. The history is that the Galatian church was not a Jewish congregation. A Gentile congregation. And when Apostle Paul was selected to minister to those, us, who are not the pure Jews, there was a conflict. How do you minister salvation to them? Do we refer them back to the dead works of religion? Do we bring them back to obeying the Ten Commandments? Should we make them go circumcise themselves so they can come under the commonwealth of Israel? In essence, should, should religion be enough? Do we mix religiosity and grace? Where does religion start? So, Peter, the one that Jesus said, build my, what did he say to him? Peter was confused. Apostle Paul up rebuked Peter several times. Today he's here. Tomorrow he shifts. So, Peter, Paul was breaking it down and he was looking for a metaphor to describe what the new covenant stands for, for the believer. And he used this illustration in Galatians chapter 4 all the way, describing Abraham, Isaac as the son of promise describing Ishmael as the covenant that was enacted on the Mount Mora, uh, Arabia, Mount Arabia, where Moses received the Ten Commandments and described it as a passing phase and then described Isaac. So we want to look at how did that interplay or work. And when he said in verse 28, now we are the children of promise. We are the children of promise. You see why I say this today is a bit doctrinal and it's meat. The reason is you now know from today's conversation the right you have to claim Abraham's blessing. What, what is the basic, the, not, not the promissory, the legal basis for you to be, you're not a Jew. We're not born in, you know, we're not born in, in the Jewish um, 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 heritage of Israel. So what gives you that legal claim on this framework, Pastor Dem? Wow, thank you, Pastor Jude, for, um, for laying that down. And you've done it in such a way that we sort of, we can see the end of this discussion, but we still have to journey through the discussion to arrive. Uh, thank you so much. I'd like to get uh, Tomiwa to give us a few of her thoughts as well. Uh, just to form a further part of this foundation before I come to Pastor Kingsley and uh, then we can go straight into the, into the meat of it. Tell me why. Thank you, P. Dell. Um, you know, as Pastor Jude, so I'm going to start from Galatians because that's what struck me the most and something just jumped out to me as um, P. Jude was speaking. And um, what jumped out to me was that by, you know, making the comparison of Abraham, of the birth of Ishmael and the birth of Isaac, by making that comparison to um, the people of Galatia at that time, he was showing them the difference between, you know, when we use human effort to do something and when we walk by the leading and the spirit of God. You know, it was clear, the minute you use human effort to accomplish a thing, God had already promised Abraham and Sarah that the child of promise was coming through Sarah. But out of self-preservation, they couldn't wait. You know, they tried to help God. And, you know, Sarah offered Hagar to Abraham to have her child. What happened then was that by that self-preservation that they had attempted to make, up until the child of promise came, Ishmael was relevant. But the minute the child of promise came, Ishmael, I mean, his relevance, he was, not, he was sent out because there was no place for him anymore. And that is how it is now. Like the, 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 
when we operate in the flesh, when we try to help God, when we try to walk, you know, by our own flesh, we're only setting ourselves up for disappointment in the future because it's not going to yield any long-term fruit, for lack of a better word. Um, it's not going to, by the time, whenever it is that we walk out of self-preservation, whenever we walk out of, you know, helping ourselves, it's not going to yield any, any long-term gain. At the end of the day, we have to go back to the place where we go back to the promise. We always have to find our way back to the promise. We always have to find our way back to, you know, the lead, being led by the Spirit of God because that is the only time that we can fully, fully, fully enter into, you know, everything that God has in store for us. So I'm, I'm going to stop then now. Thank you, Tommy. Well, those are, that, that's quite a nice um, angle that you've looked at it from. And uh, that, that also sort of um, throws light on what it must have been like for both Ishmael and his mother uh, upon the arrival of the child of promise. Because clearly that changed everything. Everything that, was, everything that seemed a certain way prior to that changed upon that particular uh, you know, incident of the child of promise being Isaac. Uh, being born. Pastor Kingsley, I'd like to get a few thoughts from you as well. Once again, good evening. <clears throat> it's there are actually so many parallels to be drawn from uh, this teaching. And for me, it, there are so many ways to look at it. But the first question that keeps tugging at my heart is, where am I in this story? Who am I in this story? Like, yeah, like Pidgeot said, it's very doctrinal. It's, it's, it's like Hollywood. It's like it's playing out. But there are so many characters there. And I keep looking at, oh, um, and I know the, the initial expectation is that, um, you know, because we're Christians now, as per church people, uh, when, when you just see the story, you immediately jump to, oh, I am the son of promise or <laughs> I am Abraham's seed. But in hearing Pidgeot, talk and hearing to me while read these scriptures i begin to check there to see okay, well let's look at these guys a bit and just look at the characters with me for a moment right ishmael I, my question really is asking what did he do wrong to be the one that is the bond son i mean like was his fault as in we offend I, I don't know if you get it and, and he's, 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 it seems like I, I, had no, I had no part to play and here I am and things no balance. It no settle for me, right? And that's a struggle. So in looking at Ishmael, I'm thinking, all of us, at different times in your life, you have found your place where you say things no balance, things no set, things, things are not all right. And at that point, you are feeling a little like Ishmael because like, who did I offend? I mean... What did I do to get into this school? I said, I didn't even send my father. Did I ask him to go and, did I ask him to go and get another babe or another girlfriend? Or another? No. So that begins to bring a sense of reality to me at the different phases of our lives that we find ourselves and we begin to ask questions, right? And I look at Isaac, child of promise. It's as if everything was arranged for him on a platter. And we know these people. There are some of us that, that in, in growing up and even in your faith, you begin to see that there are some people where it just seems like everything works for them. But this particular child of promise, son of promise actually, was a child. I mean, and PG said, if he's a child, he differs nothing from a servant. That's the scripture. So we see a child of promise that has everything going for him, but he's a child. He does not know how to maximize or even optimize what it is that is available to him. Perhaps, and I began to think, perhaps that's the reason why Ishmael was taunting him. Perhaps that's the why Ishmael is taunting him. To say, <laughs> you are the one that has everything, yet you are not able to lay hold on anything. You are the one that everything has been arranged for you. You are supposed to you're supposed to do so much but you can't even do anything can, 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 I, can I hear can I, can, I, can I be real 
let's, let's, let's look at it again and see <laughs> how many things in life are asking us that question. You know, we are sons of the covenant. We are, we are, we are, we've been given the promise. The promise is unto us. But we're still a child. You see, this, this is a very interesting twist, Pastor there. <laughs> so let's, let the conversation begin, you Absolutely. know. You know, even Apostle Paul said it in Galatians. He says that, that in verse 29, but then he that was born after the flesh was persecuting he that was born after the spirit. Even so, it is now. 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 Now, now, so you know, yep. many times when we look at these things, this is not CRUK. Mm. It's not CRUK. It's it not is. Pass exam. It's not. There is no. There is no continuous assessment. The continuous assessment is our lives. So, what have we been studying? In another two, three weeks, we'll be coming to the climax of our conversation about Abraham. So, indeed, who are we? Where do we locate ourselves in this? Maybe you thought Pastor, um, Pastor Bros was, he was quoting that for Four one. Now, that the hair, as long as he's a child, differs nothing from a servant. Though he be Lord of all, but he's under tutors and governors until the time appointed by the father so we see an Isaac that divinity had to create an orchestrate event to make the bond son to be separated from the covenant son the idea is because the son has not come of age. Of age. Mm. So the son still needs to be helped. And like we said, Abraham is not a bad man. Let's, let's backtrack very quickly, Pastor Kingsley. We need to set, you know, when you want to, Pastor, there you want to build, you do setting. Uh, mm -hmm. setting. We need to set certain things. First, let's establish, number one, the justice system of God. Ah. So, the first question you ask what crime did Ishmael commit? It's a very, very important element in this our conversation. And I'm going to approach it from two angles. The first angle, the justice system of God ensures that there is no injustice within his entire ecosystem. That's why in verse 11 of Genesis 21, when he came, I think 11 or 12, he said to Abraham, Follow your wife's advice. advice. Follow it through and through. And then he saw that Abraham was grieved. He said, but as for Ishmael, I will. So because Ishmael did not invite himself to this world, God's justice system had the duty and the responsibility to ensure that Ishmael, even though Abraham, we are, we're debating in our review today whether it's likely that Abraham got the instruction of what to dispatch those people with. Because Abraham, in all our dealings, we have not seen him as an unfair man. We have not seen him, he's dealt fairly. He dealt fairly with. Can we? We can go on now. Do you want us to do revision, right? He dealt fairly with his nephew. He said, "If you go here, I'll go here." So he didn't cheat him. He dealt fairly with Abimelech. He dealt fairly with even Pharaoh, right? He also dealt very fairly with the king of Sodom. He said, "We don't win. We have won something, but give my men." He dealt fairly with his men. He had his own consecration. He said, I will not take anything from you, O king of Sodom, but give my men that went to fight with me. So, my consecration is different from theirs. Just note for believers, don't impose your consecration on people. 
especially when it's not a doctrinal standpoint don't impose your consecration on people oh, good okay when they get there they get there if you're tithing 40 percent wait for god to reveal it to them when they get there they get there they can start from the basics they can tie 10 first you can encourage them that's the that's the okay that's it that was the distraction so but that, that's the bond womb that's the bond son god's justice system made sure he was sorted so whenever the devil begin to suggest to you that God is unfair. Tell him that evil does not come from God. Yes. Even in our mistakes, mm. he's, that's why he, he has a two-pronged approach. Goodness and mercy. So it was, it was the revelation of King David. He said, surely. There is a, there is a, there is a, there is a shorty to that. Uh, God balances his goodness the scepter of goodness and the scepter of mercy. But coming back to the second alarm that that justice system brought to us while we're reviewing this thing today. God's justice system will make him not renege, go back on his promise. Even if it means his promise funding an error that will taunt the son of promise later. God's prospering Ishmael was at the expense of Isaac generations down the line. So many times the issue of sin and iniquity is not a one generation issue. Because when a believer carries the blessings of God, God's blessings are without repentance. His gifts and his callings yeah. are without repentance. So if he has blessed you, he has blessed you. So where you channel that blessing to becomes a loss to heaven. Where you channel that thing that he has given to you becomes a loss. How is it a loss to heaven? We see many a time believers are talented and soon their talents are perverted. You know, you know the popular one now? The cherub that sat in Eden until his heart decided to go up. What's his name? Lucifer. The son of the morning. So he gives resources by covenant. Many times these resources are perverted because of his justice system. For the most part, he will not withdraw the resources, but it becomes a loss to heaven. Ishmael, even now, is a ton, taunting the sons of promise. Pastor Del. Wow, so much to, I mean, it's, uh, it's unraveling in a very interesting way. Uh, thanks for those comments, Pastor Kingsley. I, was, I, was, I had a question uh, just listening to when Pastor Kingsley was speaking. Well, two really. Uh, you sort of touched it, Pastor Jude, but I want to throw it out there. So, Abraham was, was assured by God to obey. I mean, I, I mean you said... Uh, take Sarah's advice. I think it was more Sarah's instruction. It was, it was not really advice in that sense. She was, she was, she was insistent and the, uh, you know, God advised Abraham to just go with that flow. But in, in dispatching Hagar and Ishmael, why do we think that Abraham gave them nothing? Because really, a bit of bread and water, considering who Abraham was and what he had at his disposal, that was nothing. So, I just want us to, to talk about that for a few minutes. Why, why do you think that was all? I mean, we all know what played out, how they went into the wilderness, how they literally were at the point of death, how the Lord spoke to Hagar, and how they found water. But at that point of dispatch, why do you think that's all that Abraham gave? I mean, Pastor Jude, Pastor of Kingsley, anyone can just, I guess, I'm just interested to know what we're thinking in that regard. start 
well, just like Pastor Jude mentioned, right? If you look at it, you off the top of the head, the guy is a billionaire. Let's bring it to present tense, right? The guy is a billionaire. And God says, okay, listen to your wife. Send this, send this boy away. And he rose up early in the morning. That's to show you Abraham is very obedient. You know, he rose up early in the morning and packaged agege bread and pure water and gave the boy and the mother and sent them away. Now, the reason I think it is pure water was because they didn't go very far before they ran out. So, if it was a tanker, they would have been sustained for days or some time. But he just packaged it and they ran out. Now, that begins to tell me something. Uh, two things, really. Either Abraham is wicked huh? or he was acting under instruction. Because if he's a good man, he wouldn't do that. And we know that he's a good man because the scripture says that the instruction, like Peter said, that the instruction, in fact, that the command, those that are married, you know, when your wife will tell you, for sake of national peace, you know, and the Lord said, for sake of national peace, hear your wife, right? And in that instance, I began to see, if Abraham was a wicked man, then, obviously, he wouldn't have felt anything. He wouldn't have felt bad or felt anything about driving the boy away. But the scripture said in that place, I think he said it even, even said he was in distress. If I, if I remember that scripture. Um, yeah. the, 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 yes. Yes, verse 11. Amplified, he was grieved. In fact, Amplified said, the situation distressed him greatly. So we can rule out the fact that Abraham was wicked. We can rule that out. So, leaving the other option, he's acting under instruction. So, if God has said, give the boy bread, give him water, and send him on his way, there was an instruction, there was a precursor. There was a precursor to that place. And he said, this was God speaking. God said to Abraham, do not let it distress you because of Ishmael and your maid. Whatever Sarah tells you, listen to her and do what she asks. For your descendants will be named Isaac. Meaning that even though Sarah's instruction might have been biased, but it was in alignment with divine order. Okay? Then he moves on and says, And I will also make a nation of Ishmael, the son of the maid, because he is your descendant. In other words, it was as though there is a handover process. There's, there's a process where it is like God is saying, okay, you have cared for this boy. Yes, he's not, the, he's not the promise, yes. But you've cared for him to a certain stage in his life. It's time to leave him to me. It's time to hand over his destiny to me. And I, I, I think I almost hear the Lord saying to some parents, you know, some parents, the children are rented to you for a season, right, of your life. And there's a point where it, comes, where, where, where it comes and God says, hey, it's time to hand over this next generation to me. And, and in that place, it was, it was almost as if God is saying, hey, Baba, don't worry about this one. You, you need to worry about the boy, the son of promise that is still a child. That's your new worry. But for this one, leave him to me. I will take care of him. Why? Because he's also, his, he's also your descendant. Very, 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 very instructive. Pastor, I, mean, I wanted to add. Mm -hmm. I wanted to add. Thank you, Manuka. Sorry to butt in. I wanted to also add that if you look at um, the experience with Hagar. So this is critical Bible study. So if you don't have... If you don't have a hard copy, just open your Bible and then just track, track with me to verse 18. You know? And it says, Arise, lift up the lad, hold him in thy hand, for I would, I would make him great. Okay, no, I think it's 17. 17. And the Lord heard the voice of the lad. See, in verse 16, it's the mother that was crying. Is the mother that was crying. In verse 16, the mother said, I will put this boy there. Let him die. I don't want to see him die. And she lifted up her voice and wept. 
Well, it wasn't her voice that God heard. <laughs> the Bible says, and the Lord heard the voice of the lad. Why? Remember, we are tracking back to the justice system, system of, God. of God. Abraham, I am almost convinced, Pastor, that Abraham followed the instruction of bread and a wine skin of water with pain in his heart. With pain in his heart. But he knew God too well. If God he has done it before. If God says that I will sort this boy out, Abraham had no shadow of doubt. And this one will be sorted out. And he just allowed, and he has come to trust God. Abraham's obedience was complete. And it was quick, Pastor Dell. We can't learn Abraham without learning the, the speed at which he obeyed God. He is, and the Bible is very precise, meticulous about the things he wants us to note. He would have said Abraham rose up. He said Abraham rose up early in the morning. And we are going to see this in our subsequent study. That is a pattern of Abraham's obedience. So I, I, I still feel it was predicated on Abraham's history. Yes, to so, also add something to it. Absolutely. Um, just as Pastor Doe was speaking, um, he spoke to me, what, what ministered to me as Pastor, Doe, as Pastor Jude was speaking, sorry, was that um, what, is, what is our experience with God? What do we know about God? We've walked with God thus far. What is our experience with God? A lot of times they tell us to, you know, they advise us to have a journal. And I'd advise anybody out there to have a journal. You know, where you journal your dealings with God. Because it's really, really important to have those as reference points. I'd like to echo the sentiments of Pastor Jude and um, Pastor Kingsley. When they say that, you know, they, they, they're leaning towards the, the narrative that Abraham followed instructions by sending them out with a misly sandwich and, you know, a jar of water that couldn't take them anywhere. And that speaks to sometimes as children of God, as believers, God would ask us, God would require us to do things that sometimes doesn't seem like it makes sense when we think about it in, by the eye of our flesh. When we think about it in... Log logical reasoning or like how far is this going to take me it doesn't make sense right but if we have a reference point if we have you know our experiences with God that we can refer to that we can fall back to that we can hold as an anchor right we would be able to fully walk in obedience and not just walk in obedience be swift to walk in obedience I just thought so. Thank you so much, Tomua. Thanks to all of you because you've all sort of harped on that point. I'm glad I asked that question because it, it seemed like a foregone conclusion, but there's so much in trying to respond to that. I mean, all I would add to that is, you know, for, for, for a person like Abraham who had walked with God, Abraham had a promise. He didn't see the promise. In Abraham even giving birth to Ishmael, he knew that that's not what he was told to do. He knew. That wasn't the instruction. That was, like, like Tomorrow said earlier, that was them trying to help God. You know? And then seeing that, wow, the promise still came. I don't think there's anything God would have asked him to do, honestly, that he would, that he would doubt God's ability to deliver on a promise after having given birth to, to Isaac. So there's really no doubt as to the fact that he must have received an instruction. And no matter how illogical it seemed, no matter how mean or, or you know, unfair it seemed or how, how he felt about it, he was definitely not going to disobey, which is why he got up early in the morning and he did what, what he did and, you know, sent them away. 
And of course, the story, we know the story till today. Ishmael, Ishmael didn't die. He, in fact, he was a great nation and he is a great nation, you know, in a sense. Unfortunately, like Pastor Jude said, it's a great nation that is, that, is, that, is, that is a thorn that is at the expense of Isaac, you know, and that's what it is. Uh, I'd like us to take a very short break. I don't think today's break can be long at all because there's still quite a bit to unpack. But it's time to sort of think over the things that we have spoken so far things that we have heard so far um, if you're having questions in your mind i hope you started putting them um, in the chat if you're online and if you're here prepare those questions we'll treat them in a few minutes but we should spend some time in worship this evening just to help us as we begin begin to internalize what we've heard and also like pastor kingsley said earlier on let's begin to find ourselves in this story because that's really what this evening is all about. Where am I? Who am I? And how does this apply to me? Let's spend some time in worship. For he has promised he will never fail. I will follow you. I will follow him. He has promised He will never fail His faithfulness Is forevermore His faithfulness Is forevermore all he has promised, he will never fail. I will follow you, Lord. I will follow you, Lord. He has promised, he will never fail. His faithfulness. Too free. 
hands of Jesus. You're too painful to disappoint me. Oh Lord, you're proving yourself. You're proving yourself. Time and time again, over and over again. You will keep to your word, my Savior. You're too faithful to fail me. You're too faithful to disappoint me. Oh God, to disappoint me. Oh Lord, you're proving yourself, yourself in my life. And I've come to say. Over and over again, you're proving yourself in our lives. We've come to realize that you're too faithful to fail me. Oh, oh, oh. Over and over again, God. Over and over again, God. You keep doing wonders over and over again, God. You keep changing things over and over again, God. You keep making a way over and over again, God. You keep lifting me up over and over again, God. You keep healing my body over and over again, God. You keep lifting my head over and over again, God. You keep making a way over and over again. faithful to fellow God. Amen. Amen. Pastor Jude, I want us to go back into this discussion now and let's essentially begin to bring this home because I'm, I'm confident at this point that we're all trying to find ourselves in this story. I'm confident that it's beginning to take some sort of shape in our minds and we begin to understand uh, as it has been alluded to earlier that we are I mean we are in several parts of this story at times we will be Ishmael facing those challenges at, at times we'll be wondering where our relevance went at times we'll be wondering why the promise that was assured is yet to materialize at time, so we will be we're, we're, we're in different areas but I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful this evening that indeed by the time we wrap this up it will be crystallized where our real position is and how to then launch forward but I'd like to invite you to just come back and begin to sort of let, let, let's begin to put this all together Amen. Um, it's been an interesting evening and I'd like us to just probably zone in our conversations now to verse 28 of Galatians 4. He said, Now we brethren, like Isaac, are sons of the promise. We are sons of the promise. Maybe we should read it ourselves. Let, let, let's just read it now. One, two, go. Now, brothers and sisters, Okay, let's go now. Let's go. Now, we brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children, are children of, of promise. the promise. You know, many times we go into performance mode with God. There is this clear illustration that Apostle Paul has created that, thank you, that Ishmael represented the the later the the law it represented Moses the commandments it represented 
the schoolmaster, the temporary, the makeshift arrangement that God had that came by the descent of the flesh. But how many times do we find ourselves as believers at some point or the other beginning to go circling back into dead works of religion and making it the central thrust by which we are finding a sense of connection to God. That in itself is not faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. Now, the subject of grace many times is interpreted as a means of excusing bad behavior. No, no, no. The subject of grace is a revelation that sits in your heart. Now we are like Isaac. Pastor Kingsley said it. Everything has been prepared for us. I don't walk to gain the approval of my father. I don't. There are no 10 steps. I did not become my biological son, Tobechuku, did not do anything to become. He did not end being my son. The process of life took place and he is my son. He has my DNA. He, he does not need to impress me to be my son. He cannot be my soner than he is right now. He is my son. Now, we are the children of promise. The tenant of the covenant. Jesus is the firstborn of many creations. Isaac was a type of Christ. A representation of the new covenant. Ishmael represented the, the passing covenant of tablets written in stone on stones. That Moses had to go and get. We have become the tablets. So, what was the instruction to Abraham? Cast the bond woman away. What's God's instruction to us today? Cast away the dead works of religion. So that your daily existence in God is a place you are not performing for instance why do you pray is it so that the devil oh there will be no you know how we teach some of these things and we're very guilty of it in our extreme way of trying to teach a thing you know if you don't pray the enemy will come for you he will decimate you to your prayer is a sin no why would my son talk to me in the morning it's, it's my son his relationship is a covenant. God is calling us. It, it, that now we brethren, like Isaac, are sons of the promise, is a positional statement. Yes, sir. The responsibility of making it an experience uh -huh. is domiciled in your office. The office of the son of the promise. So that, that office is what God is calling us to tonight. And I'm not shutting down the session. I'm just wanting you to see the essence of what it is we did tonight. That office that you do not need to impress God to be a child of God. You need to unlock the revelation that where Isaac sits with Abraham that's where you sit with God in Christ. Amen. Wow. Any thoughts, Pastor, Pastor Kingsley? Just add something to that. You know, when, when hearing what PG is saying about, you know, if, if I would pick up from the revelation, as it were, is, you know, Mike. sorry, PG, 
you know, you don't understand it. I can't get over the bread, you know. And the the bread takes my mind back to, you know, takes my mind back to another issue of bread, you know. For me, bread is our daily, whatever you can call bread. You can give it any name. But another issue of bread. And Jesus began to ask those guys there to say, um, I think that's Matthew 16. He says, uh, and Jesus, he says, um, the message Bible says, why all these worried whispers about forgetting the bread? Baby believers, haven't you caught on yet? Don't you remember the five loaves of bread and the 5,000? And how many baskets of fragments you, pick up, you picked up? Now, that begins to say to my mind that this revelation of who we are, I think somewhere in us, there needs to be a realization that hinges on these revelations that brings us into the reconciliation of who we are and what and how we ought to occupy that position otherwise we will keep we will keep thinking that it is the things that it is the bread that is important we we'll keep thinking that it is the things that god gives us we we'll keep thinking that it is the things that we are able to perform and achieve that is the issue meanwhile god is asking us today to take see from a different light that the things are given but the office, the position needs to be entered into because the child, as the, the son, as long the heir, as long as he is a child. So there, there's, there's the call for us to come into the place of that experience of God that qualifies us to exhibit or express the position that he had already given to us. Absolutely. Absolutely, um, Pastor Del, absolutely, Pastor Kingsley. You know, um, the issue of provisions. We see how quickly we demonize Abraham. Have you asked yourself, why did Abraham not collect Sodom, the king of Sodom's resources? Abraham understood that the covenant trumps possession. Come on, sir. Come on, sir. That's it. Some of the things we are saying tonight is when you are having your evening shower it was sinking you know he, he, he raised a very interesting scripture just tying it to bread Jesus had fed them 4,000 he fed 5,000 and when they were going somewhere they started arguing amongst themselves that they didn't take enough provision for the journey he now began, began to look like Jesus did not know how to do SWOT analysis. He did not analyze well, well the he provision. He didn't plan properly. Just the way we have looked at Abraham and nothing wrong with planning. God had a syntax of creation. He was a master planner. But understanding that the moment that Abraham heard God say as for the boy Ishmael, I will keep my covenant because he is your seed. All Ishmael needed was already inside him. What he possessed, therefore, at the time being, it was just a matter of a visitation. The seed will be multiplied and the how will play out. The seed was already inside. Abraham expressed confidence in the seed. You know how you, you, you don't interpret scriptures in isolation. You interpret scriptures based on others. If you look at the pattern of Abraham's life, he, he panicked in unbelief in some instances. But if you look at the lessons he picked going forward, he always knew that the covenant trumped what he had at the moment. Case in point, he was willing to start afresh when he had a chance to choose between going to live close to Sodom. It's not like a lot, his nephew had better sight than him. Go close to Sodom provided better vegetation for his agrarian setup. He was a livestock keeper and a farmer. And when Lot lifted up his eyes and saw the greenery around Sodom, it was a better choice. 
But he said, if you go here, I will go. That's the arrogance of understanding covenant. That that your company is blessed because you are there. Yes. It's not the other way around. So you are delivering value because that's why God sent you there. Mm. Not to preserve your means of livelihood. It is your boss that is glad. That is the state of mind of a, an Isaac believer. Now we brethren like Isaac are sons of the promise. You know what that means? That Laban went to consult years later. I want to tell you what that seed is. What that covenant is. He went to divine. And he came back to Jacob. And said, I went to Ephah. And he told me. I learned by divination. That the reason why I'm being blessed in my business. Is because of you. So imagine that. Their God will tell them. That you are the blessed one. There's a season in my life when I wake up. I kept some confessions in my lips. I am the blessed one. I am the favored one. The hand of God is upon my life. I kept speaking it to myself until that's it. You see, because when we say you are blessed, you say, man, you walk away. There is a walking to it. It is a mixture of confession, meditation, understanding the concept of this covenant and your faith action will then align. If God says, live where you are now, and he doesn't tell you where you are going to, will you live? Have you trained yourself, like Abraham, to understand that the covenant trumps possession? Wow. Wow. You know, you said something, Pastor June. You've said a lot of things, by the way. <laughs> but... Um, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just keying up to something here because what makes, what, what gives the child of promise or what gives the, the party in the covenant the rights to the promise is the fact that they are a party to the covenant. That's all. So in talking about an Ishmael, for example, is God didn't do Ishmael a favor. It wasn't like, okay, let's just pity the boy since they're about to cast him out. No, 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 no. Ishmael carried the seed of Abraham and the covenant was with the seed of Abraham. So that was irrespective of whatever was going to happen Ishmael would have become a nation in any case because that was the covenant. That was what was agreed. So in that same way if I am a child of promise, if I am a part to the covenant, that means that it's not that oh God pity me now. See my, see my condition. You know. Help me. If I was you and you are me, I will help you. You know, that's not what we're saying here. What we're saying here is that it is our right. It is our pos It is there in our hand. Do we then beg for what is already ours? Do we then spend, do we then go to the mountain for 21 days to beg for what is in our hand? Or do we just get the light bulb moment and walk in the fullness of who we are. Tomorrow, do you have any thoughts? Because we're, br I mean, we're bringing this to a close now in the sense that we have to look at our questions in a few minutes. But I'm just trying to, let me just get a few closing thoughts from all of us before we go to, to, uh, to, the, to either online or in this room and find out who, who's asking. And let's take a few questions, but please. Okay. Um, I, have, I have a few thoughts. Um, I have a few thoughts. And there's something that is drawing my attention online as well. But I would, I would um, just give my thoughts quickly before, before I go. And my thoughts are twofold. The first one is in terms of the covenant. As we're speaking of covenant, um, I flashed back to even the layman. When you watch Nollywood movies, yeah? When they want to make a, an oath, they make incisions on themselves and exchange blood right that's because it's very significant because there's something that that blood honors once you once you make once you are you make a blood exchange this is honored right and for me i looked at it as we as children of god by virtue of the fact that we are believers in Christ, by virtue of the fact that we're children of God, we're 
it's not just when we say I'm a child of God or God is my father, it's not just superficial. A lot of times we all say it and it, it seems like we're mounting it, but our hearts, we don't really understand what that means. It's, it's not just the statement we take lightly. If we're children of God, that means we share blood with Christ. That means that he's our father. And so for, for, the, for the fact that we are part of the bloodline of Christ, you know, God would always, always honor his covenant with us always he would always. always honor his covenant with us and that's why um apostle paul was saying to them that it's futile to you know operate by the law it's futile to operate through performance act and through religion and through oh ten commandments i will not what will you gain if you if you follow the ten commandments and you do not have a heart you don't have a relationship with god this is futile you you would you wouldn't gain anything and by virtue of Christ's coming, the, 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 law, the law of Moses was more or less a placeholder. By virtue of Christ's coming, it's, not, it's no more a thing of thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. It is, you are empowered, you are given the grace to live a Christ of life by the, the Spirit of God that walketh through you. It's a thing of, because I am a child of God I will not because I am a child of God I have certain you know grace abounds for me to not do these things it's not because a tablet says don't do it you know so that that's how I look at um, covenant and just because um, I mean I don't know we're closing out so I don't know if I'll have an opportunity to speak again there's something I wanted to touch on the Galatians says the flesh persecutes, persecuted the spirit and it still persecutes us even now, right? And I, 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 I began to look at how did, how did it even come about that, you know, Hagar became attached to Sarah and Abraham. It was from when they were in Egypt, right? They took Hagar as a slave out of Egypt, right? And they took, what she represented there for me was, they took a, something of the flesh. They took it out of Egypt. They got so familiar with it. Made Hagar have his child. Welcomed the flesh, you know, into their home. Made Hagar have Abraham's child. To the point where it had now come full circle and come to taunt, you know, Isaac and that's how we we as believers we need to be really really careful of the things we get familiar with in the flesh the things of Egypt that we get familiar with we need to be super super careful about it because by from uh, it's not really a big deal one will not know when they are eating and dwelling with sin and the thing about sin is it comes to bite you Yes, the grace of God abounds. We cannot discount that. But sometimes one would have experienced unnecessary, you know, taunting. One would have experienced unnecessary heartache, unnecessary trials and tribulations that one would not have had to if they had not, Otherwise, you know, carried, yeah. you know, carried the, the flesh, which is why the scripture asks us to cast out the born woman and her son. So when you see that you are, you are beginning to get too familiar or tolerate things of the flesh, you need to be spiritually um, alert. And I mean, I, 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 I commend Sarah a lot of times. They say, did Sarah act out of, you know, her personal, did she act out of her personal, how will I call it, her personal feelings by casting them out? Or did she act? I like to believe that there was a, by the wisdom of God, by the spirit of God that dwelt in her. She operated out of the wisdom by casting the bond woman out. So when we see like, oh, sin is around, let us not even sit with it. Let us not even tolerate it. Let us not even tolerate these things of the flesh. Let's cast it out, you know, at once, once we notice it, before it becomes a fruit, before it has germinated and bore fruit, before it gets to that point. Um, the other thing I would like to speak about is... Um, 
you know, a comment on 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 YouTube that was dropped by Ode Carol, Caroline. Um, I mean, your comments, especially as a woman, it's tugging at my heartstring. You know, um, you have you. It's obvious that there there are a lot of things that you have been through. I would just like to you know encourage you to explore the counseling options we have at this present house a member of our online team would reach out to you and share the I details. think they have they and have the form. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. okay they'll reach out to you so that we can begin to you know just see ways on how we can help you through through what it is that you have been through Thank you, Tomiwa. Thank you, Tomiwa. P. P. Kingsley. So, just kind of wrap this up. Closing thoughts. So my, just very quickly, my my closing thoughts will center around um, verse twenty nine uh, of Galatians four. But as at the time, the child of the flesh, born according to the flesh, persecuted the son who was born according to the spirit. So it is now also. But what does the scripture say? What, 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 what that says to me, really, is that it's almost as if, it's almost as if, if you do not cast, it's as if the presence of the bond woman will continuously inhibit the growth of the free son. So, it, so as long as she's present there, the son of promise may never mature enough to take his position. He will be, because that scripture says that he will, he, he continues to persecute. Uh, that word, the, the word for persecute there is, is to press down, right? To press down and to keep from rising. Now, this, but the scripture says cast out, and the word for cast out there is to strip of authority. To strip of position. So when he says the woman is the, the bond woman persecutes, but your action is to do what? Is to cast out. It's, it's almost as if God is saying, Hey, in my mind, is what are the things that are representative of the bond woman? Tonight, there must be a casting out, there must be a stripping of authority, there must be a stripping of, of the position that, like Tomiwa said. We have actually given space to, yeah. We have given space to. We have allowed. Because we didn't know any better. We were, we were children. But in beginning to understand what has been given to us, we must do what? We must strip of authority. And then now step into the fullness that is ours. Because the child of promise, that position is representative in Christ. So it's a case of what is the fullness that we must possess today. Pastor Joe. Thank you. Do you want to take some questions? I think we should, yeah, let's take one or two questions. Let's have a look. Uh, we have the lovely Akanimo in the audience this evening. Good evening, Akanimo. Can we get her mic to work, please? Family, um, it's just been an awesome time here. And in my mind, I just have one rhetorical question. Uh, and one thing that has been said here, one thing just strikes in my heart is, do you know God for yourself? Because we, we saw each time that Abraham has to rely on the God that he knew. You know, and if everyone takes away their testimony from you and you're left with your testimony and your experience, what would you think of God? And, and that's just the rhetorical question for me. So I'll just jump over. I don't know if we have any questions um, here. Okay. Um, so let me take one online and then I'll come to you. Okay. 
Okay, so we have one from, I think you just, give me a second. Okay, from Ilori Ola, it says, please, can you advise on how to process instructions from a spouse or superior that clearly appears to be unfair? Pastor Dale. <laughs> Um, thank you, Pastor Jude. How do you process a request that seems to be unfair from a superior or a superior? I mean, in, in context of what we're discussing today, I'm struggling to, to sort of place that in line. But the easiest way I would say is it's, it's a God thing. What do I mean by that? Um, in unfair could be unfair to you in your view, but it could be good for you. That's a possibility. Uh, it could actually genuinely be unfair, but the Bible tells us that everything will work for our good. So where you are, I mean, it was unfair for, Ish, for, for, for Hagar and Ishmael to be cast into the wilderness with, with bread and pure water. But it was essentially, at the end of the day, they were, they were, they were, they were provided for. So, uh, if you have a relationship with God, whoever wrote that question, uh, just stay connected to God because it, it's God that defends, it's God that protects. So irrespective of anybody being unfair or anybody being downright malicious, uh, if your connection to God is, is intact and you are in right standing, which you should be, uh, his grace will be more than sufficient for you. Amen. Okay, I just wanted to add to that, that if there's one thing that we have taken or we should take, if we've not yet taken it from today, is that it has been established at the beginning that God is a just God. So, and he's a just and fair God. So, because sometimes we find that we're looking at the hand of man, you know, we're looking, we're kind of depending on, you know, man's measurement of what is fair. We're kind of looking to... But at the end of the day, as long as you understand that I am a child of covenant, God's, God is a God that fulfills his covenant over me. Even if you're in a situation where it feels like, you know, you're being dealt an unfair hand, trust the fair God. Trust the fair God. Take it to him. A lot of times, my mom used to say something. Um, she was like, well, whenever your dad does something, I'll just report him to his father. That's God. Right? So trust, if you feel like, you know, you're in a situation where your spouse, your boss, take it back to the God of your covenant, the one that is your father. And I'm sure he'll sort you out. Okay. So just very quickly, all I'll add, because they've, they've said the, the basic thing, is also to consider the, the construct of the question. When you say unfair, unfair to who? Most times it's unfair to me, over and against to the other party, right? And a number of times when it comes to the things that God asks us to do, sometimes they are not always fair to you, but guess what? That unfair thing that you're talking about may actually be what God needs you to learn. Very, very hard truth, very um, different perspective about it, but because whatever he, um, Sarah said to Abraham was unfair by all standards. What to say do this to um, Hagar and Ishmael yeah. is unfair. It was unfair by all standards. But guess what? It was the will of God. It was, yeah. it was what yeah. God commanded because the yeah. guy had to go in order for this boy to grow. You know, the born child had to go in order for this boy to grow. And sometimes there are certain things that you have to let go in either with, with your spouse, that's your marriage. There are some things you have to let go in order for you as a man sometimes to grow. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Let's take a question. All right. Good evening, church. Um, my name is Omoye. When Pastor Del was speaking, at some point you talked about the fact that as Christians and as sons, we don't have to go to the mountain to pray to earn the benefits of sonship. So I have this question. I don't know if it's strange, but... Um, how do we activate sonship? Is there a process of activating sonship? Should sonship be activated? Thank you. Thank you. Who wants to jump on that one? 
I think Pidge should take it because he was really the one hammering on how his son is his son and doesn't need <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's look at Galatians 4. Yep. Galatians 4. I need uh, to know if you can help me, help me with a very simple, simple translation. This is my own. is old school. Mm-hmm. What, what let's do Amplified. 4, 1, 2, and 3, maybe 4. Okay. Amplified. Yes. Now, what I mean when I talk about children and their guardians is this. As long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, even though he is the future owner and master of all the estates. But he is under the authority of guardians and household administrators or managers until the date set by his father when he is of legal age. So also we, whether Jews or Gentiles, when we were children spiritually immature, were kept like slaves under the elementary man-made religious or philosophical teachings of the world. But when in God's plan, the proper time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the regulations of the law. That's four. Okay. So, just, just so that we don't open another Bible study this evening. But just what I wanted to point out was that the hair is the same thing as a slave as long as he's a child. Though he is the owner of everything, he is placed under tutors. What is the role of the tutor? Or other scriptures say administrator, governors. Their name tells you their role. The reason they are there for the child is because we are king and priests. Kings are governors. They are administrators. But the child is not able to administer kingdom resources. So, the father, in his wisdom, puts the child under supervision. So, in just normal logic, how would the child come to the appointed time by the father? It's by growing in capacity to administer the weighty things of kingdom. If you go down that place, it says that it says that on the appointed time, then was there talking about Jesus' revelation. That is the position, the positional placement where you are now a son by birth, but a child by birth, but to evolve into a son. You have to gain the requisite capacity in tutelage, in growth, in the things of God to the point where he can then, you can come to the appointed time. And the appointed time is not Kronos. Mm, it's, it's, it's not, it's Kairos. Now let me explain that. It's not, it, it's not five o'clock. It's not chronological time. It is a place you emerge into. It is a fusion of your quest for God, your pursuit for God, your, your being molded into kingdom-mindedness. You know, and that's what the entire kingdom submit in November is going to be about. Last year, we dealt with sonship. This year, we are progressing into dominion. The theme is the dominion mandate. Let them have dominion. It takes a son to emerge to a place of taking over, administering the resources of his father. I cannot trust my son with my car keys. He's eight years old. He's by his height. He's almost the height of some adult who drive. But he doesn't have the training He doesn't have the tutelage for me to trust an asset. If I do that, I will kill him. It is in the mercy nature of God to therefore hold back certain privileges from believers until they have come 
of age. The age, remember, is not it's not chronos, it's your kairos moment where you have emerged into the blessing of God. Uh, we leave it at that, and I see you in November. Wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, PJ. So we have one more question from Barbara. The question is, what exactly is grace? And how does grace play out in today's message? How is it relevant to us today? See, see, this, what I see, said is that that person has to go to DTI. The, 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 I th- I think that's that, the whole DTI that, curriculum. Exactly. That's the mandate. That's the entire, the entire mandate, mandate class. class. Yes. Grace, God's purpose, I will say, but Pastor, maybe Pastor Kingsley will the, give I, a I think, about it. I, I, I think P. Jude has just said just, it. Because just the invite them to DTI. Yes, so, yes, so I, I, I think I would use the opportunity to invite, I think um, online, please you can put up a DTI link there. Just come to DTI because that question will open another three or four or five or six weeks of Bible study, right? And that's what DTI is. DTI is a training and it's eight weeks long and you are, you are spending the whole first level, you know, learning these rudiments, these rudiments, these foundational principles by which we live. And that's what grace epitomizes, okay? So and, I think and DTI is physical and it's also online so wherever that person is they can register for dti and avail themselves of all the learning that comes from there in the spirit of being a pastor go through the question again what is grace yes so hold on. second one give me a second. i think i scrolled up what is grace how do, how is it relevant to yes us? what is grace how does it play out in today's teaching and how is it relevant to us right now Okay, let's use today's teaching. Grace is the the cliche definition is God's riches at Christ's expense. Another street definition is unmerited favor. But let me typify it. Isaac did not apply to be born. He was just born as the son of promise. It's not like they were feeling form and Ishmael said, no me, I will be the born son. That's the one I like, so I can confess. So, grace is God's activity orchestrated to save man from the domination that came as a consequence of sin. That it was executed by Christ. How it applies in today's conversation is that Abraham was typifying that Christ's coming, death, redemption by the covenant that Isaac became a, benef- a beneficiary, a benefactor of. All right? And the final one is what? How does it apply in our life now, today? Yes, now. You don't need to do anything to be, you don't earn salvation. You are saved by grace through faith. Scripture said it is the gift of God. So you do not... I've asked people come to introduce their spouse to be to me. Is he saved? They say he's a good man. No, you didn't answer my question. Has he accepted the salvation that Christ procured? You don't become saved by being good progressively. You become saved by accepting the, the, the provisions of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. But then you evolve in your state as a child of God by way of your engaging the tenets of this covenant, growing in the knowledge of it, and God trusting you with the assignment of kingdom for which you are here on earth for. So that's how it applies to us today. Thank you very much, P. Jude, Pastor Kingsley, Tommy Ware, and Pastor Dell. over to you. <laughs> Thank you, Akanimo. Um, in, in wrapping up this evening, I'm just trying to figure out, I, I guess we, we should at least pray for the people today. Let's just, let's just say a word of prayer this evening. Father, we, we bring your children before you, O oh God. 
We thank you for a time such as this this evening in your presence. We thank you, Father, because illumination indeed has come. We ask, O oh Lord, for hearts that are increased in capacity to be able to receive that which has been discussed, that which has been shared even amongst us this evening. Yes, Lord. We understand, O oh God, that by ourselves we have really no capacity. We need you, O oh God, to help, to enlarge our hearts, to enlarge our minds, to give us capacity even for this season, to be able to know that indeed we are free, we are the, we are the children of promise, to understand what that means in each and every life, yes, Lord. to understand the steps to take, the moves to make, the positioning to assume, O oh God, even by your Holy Spirit. Father, we exalt you in our lives, in our circumstances, and through everything that we are and do, O oh God. We ask, O oh Lord, that you be the God you are in our lives and in our homes, in our families, and in our situations, my Father. We give you all the glory. We give you all the praise. We declare indeed that you alone are God, and that besides you there is no other. Be exalted, O oh God. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. 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 I, Amen. I, Pastor, I, I like us to pray specially for Caroline today. I like yes. to ask, yes. invite Tomiwa to just speak a word of healing over her mind as she engages the counselors this season. As she engages the system. The Bible says, iron sharpens iron. So it man sharpens the countenance. The healing of the soul is sometimes a bit more that the Lord will just invade her spirit, soul, and body and cause an accelerated healing and wholeness and Amen. restoration. Yes. Heavenly Lord, we bring Caroline, we bring your child, your covenant child, Caroline, all day before you. Heavenly Lord, we ask and we pray oh Lord we know that she's hurting we know that she's weak, we know that she's weary but Heavenly Father I pray that your Holy Spirit will embrace her wherever she is I pray that your Holy Spirit of comfort will comfort her in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I pray you are not a man that you should lie. Neither are you the son of man that you should repent. That your covenant will speak for her. Your covenant will speak over Caroline Amen. Ode. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Heavenly Lord, I pray that you would be able to, you would help her by your grace and your mercy. To be able to strip away all the hurt, all the pain, all the the tribulations and trials that she has experienced so far that she will be able to cast it far away we cast it we cast it far away from her in the name of the lord jesus christ Amen. we separate her from the hold we separate her from every hold that her experiences would have over her in the name of the lord jesus christ that the blood of the lord the blood of Christ Jesus will wash her clean. Will wash her. Will wash her. Though, though these things may be on her like as red as scarlet. The blood of the Lord that speaketh better things than that of goats and ram. Will wash her white as snow. In the name of the Lord Jesus Amen. Christ I pray. Amen. Heavenly Lord, that your peace, your grace, your warm embrace would 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 surround Caroline like a shield in the name will compass her roundabout in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that she will be reminded daily daily that she is a child of promise and your covenant still stands over her your covenant you are a just God and you are a true God you are a good God and you are a merciful God so you will be merciful unto her in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ thank you Heavenly Father for this for this new lease of life you've given unto her in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ I pray Amen, Amen. Amen. 
that in itself is a testimony already.